In the summer of 1969, half a century ago, police violently raided the Stonewall Inn in New York City. Police raids on gay bars were common, but this time, something changed. The LGBTQ patrons and passers-by, many of them people of colour, fought back, sparking days of rioting. Then they began organising. They birthed the modern gay liberation movement and pride, which is now a global phenomenon. This is Working Class History. Stand up, 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 and in LA in 1967, uh, outside the Black Cat Bar, Stonewall was different. Firstly, because of its militancy and the extent of the violence in terms of confrontation with the police and destruction of property. Secondly, it wasn't just a one-off protest or incident. It lasted for six days. Thirdly, it was reported about at the time in the mainstream press, and it had a couple of photographs taken, unlike the previous ones. And most importantly, the participants and the local LGBT community used the event as a springboard to organise. They set up the Gay Liberation Front, which revolutionised the LGBT rights movement, and they organised a demonstration on the anniversary of the first night of the riot, which became Pride, a huge event each June, which takes place all over the world. We were really pleased to be able to get in touch with a couple of people who were involved in the Stonewall Rebellion, and who were happy to speak with us about their experiences. One of them was Martin Boyce. Well, I was uh, born into the working class. My father was a cab driver. And uh, I grew up with an Italian family. My father married an Italian. So I almost consider myself Italian, though my name is Boyce, because I was raised with them. And my father is an English-American Catholic. So I'm of a Catholic background, too, culturally Catholic. I was uh, born in the village. Uh, I was born in St. Vincent's Hospital, but I was raised on 43rd Street and 2nd Avenue near the UN. Oh, my life situation in 1969 was my mother was an invalid. And my father wanted to work to gain his pension. So I, they sent me to college and also I would take care of my mother. In return for taking care of my mother, I, would, I went to college and uh, also had a great deal of time in the night when my mother was asleep to go out. So that was my connection to the streets. I mean, you know, I always knew I was gay. So I just studied straight people as a child to learn how to act, to fool them. Also growing up in New York City at the time, was John O'Brien. The group he mentions, the NAACP, is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. I was born in Harlem, New York, and grew up in Harlem, New York. My parents were laborers. My mother was one of 13 children uh, born in Ireland, and uh, parents of her could not afford to feed and clothe and take care of 13 kids, so the majority were sent to the United States. So basically, um, she worked as a maid her whole life, and uh, my d- father was a custodian. Uh, so uh, Irish ancestry, very poor, uh, horrible housing uh, in old walk-ups that uh, were built during the Civil War of the United States in the 1860s. Um, there was no bathroom <clears throat> in several of these places we lived. They, they, the bathtub was the kitchen sink and you walk down the hall to to where there was a toilet. So they were old, old buildings, and they were tearing them down. So I got radicalized because of that, because of the conditions I saw around me, particularly on how uh, people of color were depicted in being, and being, um, um, what's the word I want to use, Uh, abused um, by both locally, discriminated, and watching the news on what was going on in the South. So... So at the age of 13, on my own, I went up to the Harlem branch of the NAACP on 125th Street, and I went in there to join the group, which surprised a lot of the people in the office. So I, I got involved in 1962 in the Civil Rights Movement and um, basically learned a great deal. And one of the things that happened is that I came in contact with other social classes, because um, that movement saved my life. The, all the kids in my neighborhood grew up with no hope, no future, 
many of them turn to drugs. And it's because I cared about helping people that I actually helped myself. So I'm self-taught. I never um, never finished high school because I went to Heron High School, which was the second worst high school in New York. And um, and basically there you didn't learn much at all. Over the river in Brooklyn was Martha Shelley, who was five years older than John. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Um, my father was an well, his family were immigrants, but he was also born in Brooklyn and working class people. Uh, and my mother was an illegal immigrant. Uh, when her family came, there was a, an immigration quota so that uh, they couldn't get in. They went to Cuba instead. And then uh, that, at that point, she was seven. And then when she was 16, she got on a boat, came to the United States, and went to work in a factory in New York. Uh, she met my father, and he was a citizen, so they got married, and she was able to become a citizen. Martha's mom was Jewish and from Poland. And those members of her family that did not leave Poland uh, were killed in the Holocaust. While the 1960s is now kind of often remembered as a time of freedom and sexual liberation, um, for LGBTQ people, this was not really the case at all. Uh, persecution of gay and gender non-conforming people was rife, both by the state and the general population, although the extent of this depended on class. It differed depending upon who you were and where you were. So class-wise, if you didn't have a great deal of money, it was worse for you. When I was a kid growing up, I understood that I was a criminal, I was religiously sinful, and mentally sick at the same time. Uh, there was nothing available for me to learn about me because uh, there certainly was no billboards, no television shows, nobody who was out who was in any way positive was a role model. And so when I went to the library, public library, there was nothing in the public shelves. The only thing for sexuality, that stuff was closed stacks. And if you were young, you weren't allowed access to it. So there was nothing there for me. And there was no organized gay community. And, um, but there was no support system. And when I went out looking for sex, I went to places where they said that's where the degenerates and perverts were. Oh, well, the oppression was ubiquitous. I mean, it was everywhere. The oppression could come up 20 times a day. You just live with it. Just hope to get out of the, sometimes it was dangerous, sometimes mere humiliation. I remember going to um, a hardware store, even though I wanted something completely different, the man showed me how uh, a female and a male's electrical sockets work, that the prongs go into the, he called the female part, just to show me, give me a lesson on life in front of all these other people, just to humiliate me. That was just one minor, that was just minor because there was no violence, nothing like that. But the incidents like that would occur all day. There was like no such thing as pride because pride could get you beaten. But we understood where the pride was. It was below the surface. It was our ability to resist. It was like being in the French resistance. It was, it was a lot to deal with and dealt with very well. New York was the most liberal city in the entire country. But that's, uh, and I think Ralph Ellison, the black writer, uh, on his monument uptown where he lived, it said that New York was the freest city, it's, but that's different from being a free city. But it was the freest city you could live in as far as being gay and a number of other kind of people could live here or manage to live here pretty well. It had a good reputation for gay people to live. But that was not saying much when living at the time was very, very dangerous, very, very difficult. I mean, beating up gay people was a city sport. And there were certain days when they were just given the green light to do it. And St. Patrick's was one of those days. So if you went to a policeman or you were in trouble or something, you would get no help. In fact, they would blame you or sometimes hold you for them to beat you up. So, I mean, it was pretty horrible. It was, But still, it was very exciting at the same time. The city was like a film noir city. It was much darker than it is now. And it was sort of like a film noir life. We were called the Twilight People, but sometimes for good reason. Because our lives really were lived at night. So I mean, there's a long history here of uh, of of how gays were mistreated, uh, fired from their jobs, uh, hounded, harassed, abused, and murdered. Nobody was ever being convicted of murdering gay people. 
you were rarely charged if you murdered a gay person. If you physically attacked a gay person, no charges were ever brought against you. So if you go back, you'll find that people were not brought up on charges for assaulting or hurting or murdering gays. I was lucky because I lived in Manhattan. Now, if I had lived in Alabama or Ohio or some other place, it was far worse. People came from Cleveland, Ohio to New York City to go to gay bars, the few that were opened occasionally. Um, there was generally very few gay places, and those that did have such places were generally um, attacked by police, and uh, and not just nicely in raids, and uh, people would be losing their jobs, etc., as well as being in prison. It's far worse than what the official records are, because when I was a kid, and, and for many long years after that, uh, parents could take their children that they discovered were gay and commit them to a mental asylum. Uh, others would be rounded up and locked up as criminals for violating various laws if found. A year before I was born, in the state of Alabama, uh, these police broke down a door of a, in a house that two adult males were living in in their bed. They were found in bed together. They were arrested, and within a year, they were electrocuted to death underneath the sodomy law. As in much of the world, homophobia in the US had its origins in British colonialism. As in all of its colonies, Britain introduced sodomy laws and introduced the death penalty for it in Jamestown, its first permanent settlement. And as in much of the British Empire, post-colonial authorities didn't repeal the homophobic laws. So up to 1963, consensual sex between adult men was a crime in all 50 states of the US, with penalties of up to 60 years imprisonment. Some states also interpreted these laws to prohibit lesbian sex as well. If you were convicted under these laws, not only would you probably lose your job, you would lose most types of professional registration uh, you know, for your career, and depending on your state, you could also be locked up in a mental institution for life, given things like electroshock therapy, lobotomized or chemically castrated. From 1963 onwards, a small number of states began repealing these laws, but in the late 60s most states still had them, and they were only eventually completely struck down by the Supreme Court in 2003. Homosexual solicitation and wearing clothing for other than your gender designated by the state were also illegal, and police entrapment was rife. So in New York in the late 60s, police were arresting over 100 men a week for solicitation after entrapment operations. So facing all of this repression from the state and the general population, most LGBT people hid their sexuality. They were hiding in the closet. And in fact, almost all were hiding in the closet. There were very few that were out. The very, the very few who were out who were flamboyant couldn't do anything about <laughs> but being out. They didn't hold regular jobs, and they lived as basically sex workers on the streets. So, um, and when I was a kid, there was, uh, as I said, not only wasn't there any support, there was lots of oppression. And it was organized, both in terms of government oppression, both in terms of religious institutional oppression, and, and societal oppression at all levels. For many lesbians, life was even harder. Lesbians were particularly isolated at that time, uh, far more than gay men, because the... Um, gay men had it was easier to go out and have sex and to uh, hang around in cruising areas than women um, for obvious reasons at the time women had just for being women um, you know have always had the uh, problem of uh, male violence so in fact before I left home one of the things I did was study judo uh, in the hopes that that would be some protection. Um, I think there was always uh, additional violence against anyone who was perceived to be gay or lesbian. The culture was such that uh, when I told a, a therapist that I was uh, lesbian, she said, well, you shouldn't be lesbian because uh, you're cutting off half the world. 
and therefore I should be bisexual. Now, she did not apply herself, that to herself. She was hetero. And all of the people who, in that group of people that I knew who were uh, involved in this, it was kind of a therapy cult. Uh, if you were straight, that was fine. But if you were gay, they pressured you to be bisexual. So, uh, And as far as I was concerned, I wasn't interested in whether I was cutting off half the world or not. I only wanted one person. Not <laughs> I didn't want to go to bed with the whole world. Uh, so there was a lot of psychological pressure, even in uh, New York City where you were less likely to get killed for being gay than in other places at that time. Homophobia was even widespread amongst supposedly revolutionary socialists. I was a member of the Young Socialist Alliance, which was the youth group of the U.S. Socialist Workers Party. And I had been a member of it for several years. And I was called into the organizer's office because they had heard from a person they found out to be gay, who then gave me my name to them, that I was gay. And they asked me if I was gay, and they were hoping I would say no, because I had these big muscles. I couldn't have possibly been gay, from their view. And I was one of their few actual working-class kids, because most of them were college kids, you know, professionals and stuff. So I told them I was gay, and they kicked me out because I, cause I said I was gay. They kicked me out because they said, well, I would be a security risk. And I said to them, well, how can I be a security risk if I'm openly gay? But they kicked me out only for that reason, not because I was doing something with somebody that uh, somebody complained about. The person who I fooled around with, he was found out to be gay, so they, they suspected him, and he then turned my name in. And that's how the things worked at that time. But this is a left-wing socialist group. So the anarchist at Alternate U on 14th Street, having heard about that, welcomed me in and let me join their board of directors. And uh, because my comrades, not only, not only did they kick me out of the YSA, the leaders went to the anti-war groups that I was very active in and tried to get those groups to not allow me to participate in their activities as well, which they rejected. Their own members rebelled against them because I was very active against the Vietnam War and was for years committed and dedicated, etc., so the, but the leadership, Jack Barnes, was, was absolutely upset that I was allowed to stay in the Student Mobilization Committee Against the War and these other groups. We hear a bit more about Alternative U, which John mentioned in part two. At this time, there also wasn't much of a gay rights movement. What there was called itself the homophile movement, deliberately not using the word homosexual in order to try to combat the idea that gay people were obsessed with sex. And there was a difference between the East Coast and the West Coast. Um, they had a different philosophy and, and views on the homophile movement. Uh, on the West Coast, it was more personal, supportive, building a community, identity, etc. On the East Coast, it was only around legal rights. It was, it was only around that, not around identity and building community. The main homophile group for women was called the deliberately innocuous-sounding Daughters of Belitis, uh, Belitis being a fictional lesbian from 19th century French poetry. The um, Daughters of Belitis was what you might call an assimilationist group. The idea was we were trying to prove to the world, and the gay men's organizations did the same, that we were uh, just as good as the rest of America, only somewhat different, and that we all wanted the same things with the uh, the nice job, the house with the white pe picket fence and the pension and uh, that sort of thing. And it was all focused on kind of gay civil rights. We would have speakers coming to the Daughters of Belitis to tell us that we were okay. There was this one woman who was who you could count on for once a year, show up and uh, make a little speech about um, how we were okay psychologically and there was nothing really wrong with us. We were just different, like left-handed people are different from right-handed people. And then there was this lesbian couple that lived in New, uh, suburban New Jersey that would come in and tell you how to make your uh, lesbian marriage work. For men, the main homophile organization was called the Mattachine Society, uh, named after a troupe of masked French Renaissance performance societies, and it had the same assimilationist vibe as the Daughters of Belitis. 
in general, the groups were anxious not to make a fuss, um, but they did organize one protest a year. Every July 4th, well, for several July 4ths, um, the organizations, the gay organizations, had had a demonstration at Independence Hall in Philadelphia um, in front of the Liberty Bell. And we would, the women would have to put on skirts and the men would have to put on suits and ties. And here it is July 4th and it's hot. And we're marching along looking like middle Americans walking around with picket signs, equal rights for homosexuals. And I went to that once. That was the July 4th before uh, the Stonewall riot. And I felt like a complete idiot because in my normal life, uh, I mean, except for having to go to work, uh, I did not dress like that. And the guys didn't either. <laughs> and uh, we were kind of pretending to be middle Americans. And then these tourists who had come to Independence Hall uh, would stand around and look at us like we were creatures in a zoo and sort of eat their ice creams. <laughs> and I thought, I'm not doing this again. Um, it just was too phony. John once tried to attend one of these protests as well. My previous experiences with uh, the gay movement organized was not was not a good thing because it was very um, class oriented. It was it was uh, people who were the professionals looking for respect. Um, they didn't want kids like me. And in fact, I, if you have time, I can tell you, I went to a couple of demonstrations where I was rejected because I was too young. So um, and in 1967, they they had their annual um, walk around uh, Independence Hall protesting uh, uh, discrimination. And it'd be about a dozen pickets. And, um, and I went down there to protest against the Vietnam War, and they kept us in these little police corridors with, uh, wooden, with wooden horses at that time. And they kept us across the street from Independence Hall. Johnson was president. He was going to be speaking at Independence Hall. This is July 4, 67. And so they had this annual day of reminder where they had a dozen gay men and women marching around in a little picket line in an enclosed wooden horse. At the same time, for the same amount of space they got, there were 4,000 of us who were squeezed into the wooden horses to protest the war in Vietnam. And if you did not fit in that wooden horse, you were not allowed to be part of the demonstration. It was a way of keeping the numbers down in opposition to the war. Well, two people, David McReynolds, and myself, we went over to join, as well, the gay protest. David was open, so he had his suit on, and he joined. He was in his 30s or 40s then. I was 18, no suit, wearing jeans, and it was very brave for me to try to go over and join the, the protest because I'm in front of all my friends, you know. I'm not really out at that time. I was in the closet. So... So I went over to join the, the demonstration. They wouldn't let me on because, one, I was underage. You had to be 21. Two, I wasn't wearing a suit because women had to wear dresses and men had to wear, wear suits. And you had to carry a sign, and you could not say anything. Those demonstrations, you had to remain totally silent and to let only the spokesperson do the talking. So no yelling, no slogans, walk around a, a circle, and if you're underage, you're not allowed to. A year or so later, John tried to attend an event at the Mattachine Society at a hotel, but he couldn't afford the entrance fee. And when I went to the hotel, I, you know, found these all these professional men in their suits. <laughs> and, of course, there was a charge to go in. You know, I didn't have any money. So they looked at me like, you know, I'm from another planet, you know, because class-wise, you know, I'm just this, you know, because they didn't know I was gay because, you know, I, I said I had a lot of big muscles then. I was tough. So basically, they, they saw me, you know, as, as somehow the help, you know, when I showed up at that hotel. The bar was up, but, but it was like this hostility, like, you know, who is that, you know? Now, of course, when they weren't in that hotel, when they were out on the streets, or that, they'd be more than happy to pick me up. You know, these are the guys I met who were more than happy to take me to bed and 
then as soon as they get their sex over with, I'm out the door and there's no communication. If they were scared to death of seeing me, you know, I mean, just to give you a little thing to, to understand the time. People I met for sex would not acknowledge even knowing me or seeing me on the street, not because uh, I was working class, but because people would think that they would be spotted as being gay. That was the fear that, you know, you don't even stand with somebody who's also gay because then you could be identified as such. That was the fear. That was the internalized self-oppression that was going on then, the great fear. Laws against gay and gender non-conforming people basically meant the only bars which would cater for them were run by organized crime. There were raids in the bars, and of course the bars for both men and women were in New York owned by the mafia, and they paid protection to the cops. The uh, that didn't always work because at times the cops would just raid the bars and the pretense of, quote, cleaning up the city. And um, in order to get into the bars, you had to pay sometimes an entrance fee. You had to pay an entrance fee to get into an interior room where you could dance with another woman. And you got to buy watered down drinks. There was a lot of pressure to buy drinks. And this wasn't it didn't suit me at all. I didn't dress right. I didn't look uh, the right kind of uh, butch or femme. And I never had any success in the bars in getting to meet other people. At the time, it was against the law to allow gay people to congregate in your business. Um, so if you allowed gay people to congregate in your business, you were basically aiding and abetting in criminal activity. So the bars that allowed gays to congregate on, on different levels were mainly in New York, where I was, op operated by the mob because they, of course, paid off the cops. And, uh, and this is nothing new. Uh, paying off the cops was not just in New York, but it was in most countries and, and most cities that had such places. But, but regularly, there would be police raids to keep clear of who's in charge and to keep us in our place. So I was too young to go into the bars, but the other reason I didn't go into the bars is because I had no money. So um, I was a working class kid. I had no money at all. I was hanging out on the streets on Christopher Street and down at the piers and have sex in the trucks and go to the open parks because that was the thing that was common for most working class kids. It still goes on today. If you don't have money, you are more limited in access for many things in life, uh, which includes sex. Unlike John, Martin was old enough to go to bars. The street queens are my crowd, the Scare Drake street queen. They were interesting, they were fascinating, they were great raconteurs. Uh, they were just fascinating. I was absolutely obsessed with them and was glad to be part of them. It looked like in a very oppressive world, we had created a comfort zone amongst us and around us because we understood each other very, very well. The Stonewall Inn was in Greenwich Village, a historically bohemian neighborhood on the lower west side of Manhattan, which was the center of gay life in the city. The Stonewall is actually still there, although it's not the same as it was. After it was shut down, it later reopened in 1990, occupying half of its original space. It's situated on Christopher Street, near its intersection with 6th Avenue, which runs west to the piers, which at the time were full of delivery trucks at night and were a popular cruising spot. The Stonewall was Martin's favourite place, because it had one key difference with almost every other bar in the city. Oh yes, because the Stonewall was the only dancing bar, so everybody went there just to dance. I mean, it was such a novelty, it was such a wonderful thing to do. One of the freest things you could do would be on a dance floor in a gay situation. It was unheard of, publicly. Well, Stonewall was centrally located in the village, so it could uh, people that would come to the village could stop by, or you could check it out. It was easy to get to. It was a gay-friendly neighborhood, the most gay-friendly in the whole city. And we would go there maybe at 11 or later, especially more in the winter than in summer. And it was a completely mixed crowd. There was only one bar for dancing, and everybody had to share it. So, And the bar was not a very attractive place. It was, uh, they didn't have any running water. So if you knew, you would order bottled beer because you would 
not get sick that way in case, you know, that could happen. And it was really a dump. It was controlled by the mafia, but it was wonderful for us because it was our place. And it was, uh, since there were so many groups of people in there, you would find your own crowd mixed in with all these other crowds in the bar, which made it a very exciting place to see other lifestyles within the gay community, even if you were sometimes hostile to those lifestyles. But things would break down. We're all gay and we're all friendly. Something worth pointing out at this stage is about language. So at the time, uh, terminology about transgender people was different to how it is now. So the general term for people assigned male at birth who were gender non-conforming to varying degrees was drag queen. So this term included men in drag, but also people who in current parlance would be trans women. At the time, the only people who were generally considered trans women, then more usually called transsexual, were people who'd undergone gender reassignment surgery. So these were the only people legally allowed to wear women's clothes, whereas for drag queens and trans women who either didn't want or could not afford gender reassignment surgery, it was illegal. So police would check people's genitals during police raids to determine who they could arrest. Due to recent disputes between people who oppose rights for trans people, transphobes, and supporters of trans rights, the identity of numerous people involved in the Stonewall Rebellion has been disputed. Again, because of the time this took place, many of the participants didn't refer to themselves as trans because that term wasn't in use, um, but other participants later described themselves as trans when the terminology did come into use. So it's clear that many trans people were involved in the riots, as were non-transgender gay men and lesbians. Anyway, here Martin explains more about the different subcultures represented at the Stonewall. One of the biggest ones were the black drag queens, and they were very, very important because they were very, very hip. There was no doubt about it. And they controlled the jukebox. So they were always around the jukebox. And if you went to the jukebox and played something they didn't like, you would never get to the jukebox again. It was sort of the way so they used to, at the time people used to control the telephone at prison. I mean, that was the center of the very center of the bar. It's nerve center was that jukebox. And uh, they controlled it and they would vogue to songs and they would always be entertaining. They were always on. So they would absolutely agree. Everybody agreed that they could control that. Uh, The part of the bar in which you walked in, which did not face the dance floor, was more like a regular bar as opposed to an open dance bar. That was uh, the A-gays, the guys in suits, who were very hostile to the scared drag queens. By scared drag queens, I mean... Queens that looked like Boy George. They weren't in full drag. They were just were gender benders, so to speak. As well as providing music to dance to, the jukebox at the Stonewall served another function. Uh, the jukebox was also used to answer people. I mean, if you had an argument, you could always find a song on the jukebox that could answer that person. I remember two drag queens were having a fight over who looked better. And one of them triumphantly went up. The first one could get there to the jukebox to play they ain't nothing like the real thing baby and would snap her fingers and let the song talk for her and you would assume that uh, she was the real thing so so the the music was used in many different ways not just for dancing but for this kind of uh, communication or expression really i should say police raids on gay bars in new york happened a lot however they usually gave advance notification to the mafia and undertook the raid at a mutually convenient time so as not to cause that much disruption. But this raid was different. This time, authorities wanted to shut down the Stonewall for good, and they planned to raid it at its busiest time, in the early hours of Saturday, the 28th of June, 1969. As is quite common in historical events, there are multiple different narratives about what exactly began the riot, but Stonewall is pretty unique in that its specific trigger is hotly debated, basically because of transphobes trying to erase the role of trans people in the rebellion, and on the flip side, others trying to highlight it. So some people say it was started by Marsha P. Johnson, uh, a legendary black trans activist, although she herself said she arrived after it started. Others credit Puerto Rican trans woman Sylvia Rivera, although she wasn't actually present on the first night of the rioting. Multiple first-hand accounts, supported by journalists from the Village Voice who were on the scene, state that a key trigger outside the bar was a lesbian described as a quote typical new york butch being arrested and calling on the crowd which had formed around her to quote do something in 2008 biracial drag king performer uh, stormy de Lavery, known as a guardian of lesbians in the village stated that she was this individual still other people credit an unnamed puerto rican drag queen outside the bar putting her fist in the air and yelling gay power 
The police officer in charge of the raid stated that what started the oppositional atmosphere inside the bar was trans women and drag queens resisting the genital checks, and others still credit lesbians resisting intrusive body searches. In a chaotic situation involving lots of different people in various locations, different people are going to see different things. 50 years on, there is no way of knowing what the exact first trigger of the riot was, and most likely there was no single event from which everything else followed. But what is completely clear is that trans people, lesbians, gay men and gender non-conforming people, many of them people of colour, and pretty much all of them working class were involved and fought together. Anyone who's been involved in a riot knows that it's not an individual act, it is a collective act, where lots of people start acting together as one. So, bearing all that in mind, this is what Martin saw himself that night. Well, what happened was me and my best friend, who's like a platonic lover, Bertie, Bertie Rivera, we were going to go to Stonewall at about, I forgot what time, but we were going there, that was our plan. But the point with Stonewall is you never could be sure you're going to get in because they control the bar from the door and they didn't want the bar to tip too many drag queens, too many butch, too many this, too many that. They wanted to keep the bar open so that everyone, it would just not tip and become a certain type of bar. So it would just become, you know, the bar that uh, sort of seemed like welcomed everybody, but it really didn't. They really were controlling who was in the bar and who could be there that night. And one of my friends, um, who was very similar to me and Birdie, couldn't get in. So we knew we weren't going to get in. So we were on a stoop up from the bar, deciding what we were going to do. And there was a ruckus. Someone behind me said something about a raid. And the crowd behind me got thick and was heading towards Sixth Avenue. Many people to get out of that area. Because, I mean, all of a sudden, the street was ablaze with uh, what used to be called the uh, bubble lights then on the police cars, the paddy wagon. And, and turmoil and confusion. And so we ran over to the bar. and They were already taking people out to put in the paddy wagons. As soon as I got there, uh, a queen kicked one of the policemen in the shoulder for the paddy wagon. I only saw her high heel. And he went in and, well, just kept beating her because you could hear flesh again and bone against that metal, which was a brutal thing to see. I mean, right off the bat. I mean, we knew they were brutal, but they usually weren't brutal in front of us, in front of a huge crowd, in an important intersection. This was unusual. And what happened was we formed a semicircle around the bar and around the police and was watching the proceedings. The drag queens were coming out and waving, other people were coming about in tears, some coming about ashamed, all the people that usually caught him there. But this was not an unusual thing. When there was a raid, we normally went to see who was in there. It was almost like a shot in front of that we uh, were glad it wasn't us, and now we could watch a show. There was no this sense of unity as it would be within a couple of hours, which was new. And he, uh, he the, the um, fatty wagon went away. The crowd was just lulling. This huge policeman, a very ugly man, uh, in front of me, turned around to us and said, all right, you saw the show, because this was routine. Now get the fuck out of here. And he turned around again because he knew we were going to move and leave because that's what we always did. But this time we didn't. Nobody communicated. Nobody said a word. But everybody took a step forward. And I couldn't see the expression on anybody's face because we were all looking at him. But something must have happened in the crowd. Something must have happened to our faces. Because as he turned around to repeat the order, and for the last time as far as he was concerned, he blinked, gulped, and we knew we got him. He moved back. The right was on. The right was on in different sections at different times of this semicircle or amphitheater because it was enough provocation for every small group along the line. And that was our provocation. But when he ran, it was almost instinctual, by way animals think, to give chase. And we did. And he um, and the others, they locked themselves into the um, bar. And the crowd just went crazy. We started throwing pennies at first because they were coppers. They were called, you know, made of copper as an insult to them, and then it got worse. So just to clarify here, at this point there are around six male police officers in the bar, as well as two undercover women officers whose job it was to identify who various people were in the bar to be arrested. Um, the male officers had been searching and taking IDs from people inside the bar, um, but now the officers outside had fled into the bar and they barricaded the doors shut to try and keep out the now angry crowd which had formed outside. 
the two journalists from the Village Voice, which back then was a very homophobic publication, hid inside as well, fearing for their safety. And then uh, bricks started appearing and, and, and stones started appearing and, and everything we had in our pockets that we could afford to lose was thrown at the bar. And someone got lighting fluid and just put it on the door and set it afire. At this same time, John O'Brien was nearby. I normally spent every Friday and Saturday night on 8th Street and 6th Avenue, which is the Avenue of Americas, talking politics. And I would spend several hours there and then go down Christopher Street and have sex. Well, on that night was, was the police sirens you could hear, and people were running down the street and away towards the subway. And, of course, I ran to it. <laughs> um, because uh, I was political. So I wasn't there when they first when they first pulled people out. I wasn't there. I was still down the street. So when I got there, the the rebellion had already started with the cops running into the bar, and so they locked themselves in the bar uh, because they were freaking out over the anger. What they had never had before was gay people coming together, united, and focused their anger on the cops. The cops who before that were able to pick off people. There was no response. The, they would be easy victims. They would be, uh, you know, just go along with whatever is being handed out and dealt to them. Uh, because of that psychology of accepting being a victim. That night, there were people who didn't. So it started with yelling at the cops and then pushing the cops and then uh, throwing things at the cops first some loose change, and then cobblestones, uh, which were big and heavy from uh, taking out of the street. This one queen, Miss New Orleans, and in a riot, it's very hard to see one thing. It's a kaleidoscope. You're always moving. It's kinetic. And this one queen, which I'll never forget, Miss New Orleans, was on top of this window ledge. And I never saw a face of determination like that. Other. Only faces of the abolitionist John Brown. And that's what she reminded me of. The intensity in her face, to write, I guess, the wrong she felt was amazing. I mean, I just couldn't believe how, how determined she was determined. She was one of the great heroes. She jumped down from the ledge, went to a, a meet, parking meter, started pulling it out, almost did it herself, but other people helped then, and they started trying to break the door down. I didn't really realize they really were trying to get into that bar. I thought this was merely, you know, something to do, something that we could... Um, to, to relieve the um, anxiety and frustration. But they were really trying to get in. It would have been a disaster had they. But the riot kept going. Inside the bar, the police experienced what it was like to be on the other end of the type of power relationship they were used to, where instead of them being able to intimidate and be violent towards others, they were the ones outnumbered, and they were shitting themselves. Uh, a couple of them were war veterans, and later said it was the most scared they've ever been. But they did have guns, and they did later say they, they were prepared to fire on the crowd if they'd managed to get inside the bar. One of those people trying to break in was John. And I got involved with the parking meter, where we took the meter out of the ground. It had been partially loosened by a car who hit it, so it was basically already bent. So we took that out, and we used that on the doors at the Stonewall to try to get the cops inside. So I was... You know, not an average gay guy. I was pretty butch. So, and the and there's the other people included on that parking meter. I don't know all their sexuality, but I do know that they were angry and they had enough. It was the right time, the right place. It was at a time when people were challenging government authority at all levels. Uh, it it was because of the '60s, and especially because of the civil rights movement that we were able to do what we could do there. So taking a, a uh, parking meter and using it as a battering ram to try to get to kill the cops would um, today be a shocking thing for most people. So 50 years ago, trust even, <laughs> was even more shocking that gay people were willing to do that. Now that a fight back had started, it took on a momentum of its own. And the whole point of the right, somehow we all realized without having leadership, was to keep it going. And this is what the police did not want. But the geography favored us, and we were like the American Indians. We knew the forests and the plains better than the police did, because we really knew the village. 
<clears throat> every time they chase us to break the ride up, we were able to evade them and come back to the same spot because of the geography of the village at that, that point. And also because we were attacked so much that we didn't realize that we had become pretty well trained in some aspects of being urban guerrillas. I mean, we always, if we were attacked uptown or something, going to the movies, we could always break up and find each other. Nine out of ten times we'd find each other. This came in very handy <clears throat> for when we were dispersed and then we had to regroup. The police inside the bar called for backup and eventually arrived in the form of the tactical police force, riot officers with clubs, guns, helmets and shields. I think the most famous incident in the riot, and nothing is louder in a riot than silence, is the entire area went silent, except for this kind of hoof. There was a marching sound, a thumping sound, a stormtrooper sound, and the crowd opened up and there was the tactical police force. And they were really designed to fight real riots. I mean, the riots that were uh, uh, plaguing America all over the country, something righteously so, but nonetheless. And they did not know what to do. Here they confronted a bunch of queens, and we didn't know what to do. Here they were, like, decked out in shields and, and head masks and everything you could think of. And that moment, we had to do something. We was always having to do something to keep the show going. We all linked arms and started singing, we are the village girls. We wear our hair in curls. And we did a kick, a roxette, a roquette kick. And that shocked them, but that forced them to charge. And they did charge, and they did break us up. But it was very, very campy. And uh, an amazing part of the, the uh, riot to see the two groups look at each other in absolute wonder. They got the tactical patrol force to come, which is the emergency. It's like today's um, SWAT teams, etc without the guns, but it was there, it was there, the police who normally deal with rioting and political demonstrations, etc. Basically, a large crowd was watching. Now, in that crowd were many gay and lesbian people and allies. So they consciously blocked the streets the first night and over the next few nights, preventing the police cars from getting down the streets to us. In addition to the telephone interview we did with Martin, we went to the Stonewall Inn and the surrounding streets and had a really fascinating chat about what happened over those nights. One of the questions I asked him was if he saw people get injured. The street where we spoke was quite busy, so there's a fair bit of background noise, but hopefully it's still comprehensible. Yes, and the trouble was that it was mostly friendly fire because we weren't exactly baseball players. <laughs> so you saw a queen throw a brick. Didn't land over there. It landed on some other queen's head, but nobody minded. We did help bandage them, whatever we could do for them. Nobody minded, they were just escorted out of the... It was actually very funny. They were escorted <laughs> out of there, and you know, they had tears in their eyes, but they weren't sorry. No one was sorry. So we stopped throwing bricks, because you know, and we threw orange peels and things like that, because like, you know, we were just having, the cops weren't hitting us, but we were certainly knocking these queens down like bowling pins. On that first night of the riots, property damage was pretty much limited to the Stonewall Inn itself, as protesters broke all the windows, tried to batter down the door, set fire to it, and tossed bottles of burning liquid like improvised Molotov cocktails inside, which the police had to keep putting out. Other than that, people focused on resisting the police, and would reform kick lines and sing, wait till the police charged, and then break at the last moment and reform elsewhere. Clashes continued until the small hours. The riot kept going on. They didn't catch us. It just died down. I remember sitting on a stoop and I saw a queen across another stoop, exhausted, her head down and her, her knees. And six feet away, a cop also exhausted, not bothering with her. Uh, the street was smoky from the fires that were set and broken glass that was smashed, stores that were swiped. And all this glass, like diamonds glittering in the street, and it took on the effect of diamonds when the sun came up because it all glittered. It was actually one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. Sadly, it came out of such a tragic event. But nonetheless, I went home and I thought, we're gonna pay dearly for this. Now I thought, we are gonna just pay for this. But when I got home, my father congratulated me. <clears throat> it must've been on the radio. The next day, word of news traveled throughout the city and the whole city knew whether it was in the paper or not, because this was the kind of thing that people are interested in generally. And things had already changed. Unlike a lot of LGBTQ people's families at the time, Martin's dad always supported him. My dad was very supportive. My dad, um, you know, had seen the streets, knew the streets, and understood the streets. He was a cab driver since 1933. 
And, uh, he, you know, there was a cookie jar with cash in it. And he told me, you know, if you're ever arrested, because he was sure I was going to get arrested, uh, just call and here's the money to get you out. I'll leave it in here. So you all, you know that we have it. And all you, so he was very supportive because I could go out and uh, if there was a confrontation with the police, I could be least worried of all my friends <clears throat> because I had support. But when I got home, my dad just said, you know, the terminology was different than he just said, it's about time you fags did something because he had seen all this oppression all these decades. I never thought we really were doing anything really wrong since it was consensual, private, and nobody's business, he thought. So it was a, he was an amazing man for that as a working class man, as a man who trained boxers and trained guard dogs. Very, very butch man, was very, very sensitive to me. He never held it against me. He didn't think it was all that, you know, being butch and being, you know, what society thinks a man should be. And I must say that the Stonewall riot was not an anti-straight riot. It was an anti-police riot. So gays in their hearts didn't have it in for straight people. They really wanted a better world, even if it was just better for themselves at first. They were in the right trajectory. Their hearts were in the right place. After that first night, Friday night, rioting continued until Wednesday night. Then LGBT people who took part in the riot, as well as others, started organising forming the Gay Liberation Front and organising a protest on the anniversary of the Stonewall Rebellion, which became Pride. All of that is in part two. Our Patreon supporters can listen to part two now. For everyone else, it'll be out next week. Putting together this podcast takes a lot of work, which may not always be obvious, so we thought we might explain a bit about how it works. So at any point, we're working on several episodes at once. We spend lots of hours researching a subject first off, getting hold of and reading books, watching films and documentaries, and reading everything online we can find. Sometimes it takes us quite a while to find people to interview, and then some people are happy to be interviewed right away, but it can take us months uh, with some people to build a relationship um, to the point where they're happy to go on the record and be interviewed. After the interviews, we begin editing, uh, which can be really time consuming. Uh, Generally, we have to do three or four runs through before we get it right. Finally, we write a narrative, record that and do a final draft edit which we then listen through make final changes and then we listen through that one last time to double check all told it's quite time consuming we are taking time out from our day jobs through 2019 to be able to devote enough time to do this uh, to try and do a good job but ultimately we're only going to be able to keep dedicating this amount of time if we get more support from you our listeners on patreon patreon supporters get early access to episodes bonus audio free and discounted merch and more so if you can, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory. If you can't, that's cool too. Please just give us a review on Apple Podcasts or share our episodes on social media so we can get more listeners. We've produced some Stonewall 50th Anniversary merch to help support our work. Check that out on our website, linked to in the show notes. This narrative was recorded by Jesse French. The music for this episode is Stand Up For Your Rights by the International Gay Society, courtesy of Chapter Music links to stream it and buy it in the show notes Um, it's from a great album of songs from the gay liberation movement um, in the 70s so check that out as always thank you so much to all of our patrons whose generous support enables us to keep making this podcast and running wch catch you next time Hi, and welcome back to part two of our podcast on the Stonewall Riots and Pride. If you haven't listened to part one yet, I'd go back and listen to that first. Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Yes, we have. After the first night of rioting, word got out about what happened, partly through word of mouth in the gay community. So the following night, Saturday night, which was technically the early hours of Sunday morning, uh, an even bigger crowd gathered and rioting reignited. Things died down a bit on Sunday night, but clashes continued on Monday and Tuesday, and there was a final confrontation, which again was a big battle on the night of Wednesday. Martha Shelley was actually in the village on Saturday night and saw the clashes, but didn't realise what they were about. It was uh, Saturday night, and there were two women uh, from Boston who uh, wanted to start a Daughters of the Leaders chapter, and they were visiting New York City. And the 
women who were um, running DOB were, uh, they asked me to give these women a tour of Greenwich Village and so on. So I took the women down to Greenwich Village and gave them a tour, and that night we passed by the stone wall. And I saw these young people throwing things at cops, and the women from Boston were taken aback. They said, what's that? And I said, oh, that's a riot. We have them all the time. And I thought it was an anti-war riot, which we did have all the time at that point. And I didn't realize it was a gay riot or I would have stopped and participated. Martin Boyce was one of those who felt compelled to go back the next night. Well, I went back because that was my, um, that was my hangout, my street. You see, one thing I would like to explain is I think that if anybody, you know, who listens uh, has ever seen West Side Story, New York in the 60s was a city of turf. Everybody had their turf that you didn't go into very easily. Uh, the Latin turf, black turf, white ethnic turf. We were the only people that didn't have a turf, except finally Christopher Street did become our turf. And that invasion of the turf, invasion of the one place we could go and not have to look behind us, not have to look in front of us, not have to worry because of the safety in numbers, the one street that was really open to us, that was really a street and not an alley, not a park, not a highway, was invaded, invaded. And the bar that was the most popular there, the bar that had an opening to living like other people and dancing, expressing us like other people, was gone. So the reaction uh, to, the, to the, uh, the raid, which was a very foolish raid because it was a raid in the middle of the city. Most raids occurred and most bars were on side streets that were not, or yeah. so easy to get to or so noticeable or so public. But this was right in the middle of the village. And uh, it was worth the fight because to hold on to some sort of dignity John O'Brien felt the same way. The heterosexuals had every place else in the fucking world. Only streets, had two little streets on Christmas Street going down, and we were determined that that was going to be our space. We weren't going to give it up. So it became a turf battle. And, uh, and it involved many more because they identified seeing it as their streets too. So for the same reason, because people had gotten tired we were, we were pushed into an area, uh, it was called the meat rack, which is basically, um, these were areas where, where, you know, nobody wanted to go to, you know, it was smelly and dirty, it was back of trucks that normally would be moving uh, dead animals for the slaughter, for the meat area. And these are the only places that we had to socialize, to have sex, and to meet other people who were gay. So we were in, you know, these these areas that nobody else would want, and they were picking on us there too. So we just had it. There was, you know, there was no place else to go. This is this was, um, you know, we're going to stand there, and no matter what happens. As well as protesters, the police were also back the following night, but this time they were prepared, and they wanted revenge for their humiliation. The violence got worse over the night, but we we came back every night because it was the thing to do. You know, it, was, it was the scene, it was the place, it was what's happening. It was like going to a rock concert every night and, and waiting around for something to happen. And, and every night something did happen with the police insisting that it was their streets and that we get off their sidewalks, that we get off the streets, and they were shoving and pushing. And, of course, that started the resentment and people then fighting back. And um, and the police, of course, patience was less. They knew there were gays down at the trucks and having sex and they in the bars, but they never knew that all these other people <laughs> were also gay a lot of times, and um, and so they were frustrated with um, with the amount of support. As I say, people gathering around, consciously not moving. Uh, if they didn't have to, and the police trying to push through these crowds, um, where the police got it, they they figured, you know, they figured after a while these are not just innocent people who just happen to be standing there and blocking because uh, of wanting to see what's going on. Even though there was some of that, because uh, on Friday and Saturday night and Sunday, the village was a place you, that people went to party. They would go out to bars, etc. But um, they, they got it that a lot of people there were very much uh, opposed to the police. 
and you know, and they were just freaking out of the whole thing uh, and getting uh, more pissed off because that they weren't controlling the streets and the sidewalks, which they had been used to. When they would tell people to move, people would move. And here they were not moving. On these subsequent nights of rioting, there was also widespread property destruction. But there was a bank on the corner of Sheridan and, um, and Christopher, and there was another bank down on 6th Avenue and 8th Street, and those windows were smashed by people who were protesting the police raids and brutality. So it, the, the, the rebellion grew in the area. You know, it was, so it was no longer around Stonewall alone. It was all along Christopher Street and up and down 8th Street and in the areas around it. So uh, it was mobile. So basically the rebellion was us and we were on the move. While the fighting was ongoing, some rifts started to open up within different elements of the gay community. There was a bar right around the corner called Julius, which is fairly famous in the village. And, and that bar is a gay bar. All, all that was in there was packed with all these professional guys. You know, that's women. When we were running around the streets fighting the cops and the cops were chasing us, people from Julius came out and grabbed some of our people to hold for the police. These are gay people. That was that mentality of being subservient to you know, hetero laws, hetero rule, and oppression, and accepting it, to the point where you actually came out of a bar and you grabbed people who were, who were challenging the police. Some straight people also joined in the fighting against the police. David Van Rock, who is a fairly well-known uh, musician, um, who was an anarchist, and he was heterosexual, was arrested that first night, fighting the police. And a lot of the people who took part in the rebellion, I don't know their sexuality. Um, they were, because it was not Rock Hudson, and it was not Liberace, the people who fought the police were people who could not do anything but that, because they had nothing to lose. So they didn't have to worry about jobs, they didn't have to worry about a future career, and who would find out whatever. So it was the street kids, kids like me. Uh, a lot of the kids who were sex workers, I was not. They were working class kids. So mainly people of color was about, I'd say, half the crowd. The ones who were actually rebelling. Not, not the ones standing around. The ones standing around and observing, that crowd was mostly white. But um, you know, professionals, etc. But but the actual troublemakers, the kids, the people fighting the cops, were um, only working class, with no jobs generally. A few may have had jobs, but you know, uh, they joined in. But it was but their jobs would probably be working in, you know, manual jobs. Nothing, nothing, nothing in terms of uh, any kind of professional occupations. You know, you didn't find you didn't find them there. So uh, heavily young people after the first night. The first, ni the first night had older people who were the ones who sat around on those benches who were um, substance abuse users and homeless people of all ages. But there was a number of, of what I call older people. So for me then I was 20. So older people to me was in the 30s. <laughs> but uh, among the gay kids, um, it was, um, you know, there were, there were white kids like Jackie Hormonum. There were black kids like uh, Marsha Johnson. But the main thing is we, we didn't allow people generally to photograph us. So the big, the big troublemakers, like myself, we smashed cameras and stuff. So there was none of that um, because obviously what we were doing would get us into trouble. So there's, there's not much film footage actually of Stonewall. The rebellion. There, the the photos that exist are mainly people who were posing for pictures who were not actually fighting the cops for the most part. There was a few kids who were the couple of pictures like McGrath had, where the kids who actually were fighting the cops were in also, but they certainly weren't showing them then. They were they were standing with a group of other kids, but they weren't the 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 biggest uh, fighters were not wanting to be seen by the cops having evidence against them because, you know, we didn't know if we were going to get arrested, right? 
Dave Van Ronk, uh, the folk singer mentioned by John, was arrested for punching a cop on the first night of the riot. Um, his life was actually the loose basis for the Coen Brothers film, Inside Llewellyn Davis. Um, anyway, sitting in Christopher Park the other week, just opposite the inn, uh, Martin also told us about a solidarity he witnessed from straight people. There were two really big football type, two black guys, straight, football types. And uh, they looked, and I remember one of them said, man, what's going on here? They one said, I don't know. So let's go in. He said, hey, they're gay. He said, they are fighting the police. And they went in like tanks. No, it, because, you know, you never can um, judge an individual. You know, my father, who saw so much oppression from the cab, or these two guys that saw someone fighting the police, and, you know, that's your ally then from that moment. You're not just allies, you're a lawyer at that moment. So, I mean, no, no, there were people good people, strong people, street people, who really um, had a heart and were sincere and knew when to band together or not. So no, there were straight people even the first night that did help, did support, did cheer. And then later, later in the week, I was walking down my street, I was very loud, and uh, there was a sanitation worker, a big strong guy throwing all the garbage in, and he looked at me, and I said, oh, God, you know, he's going to succeed. And he gave me this look, and then he raised his fist. I can tell you the thrill. The thrill of such a man, you know, whom everyone would assume would be so anti-gay, really recognizing something that was done. That was amazing to me. And that's when I knew the world was changing. And it changed. Amazing. I'm probably Italian. Really rough guy. I mean, not no one to play around with. I, mean, I could have kissed him; he would have burned me. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, that was like, wow! I said that was important. Martin also told us about some of his friends who participated. Just the names of those fighters. I mean, Dead Frog Jerry, Congo Woman, Mary Queen of the Scotch, the old salty dog Captain Faggot, uh, Miss New Orleans, uh, Black Twiggy, White Twiggy. I mean. These were queens of the John Waters um, syndrome, if you want. This was the beginning in culture, too, of, of this world of John Waters, which was a world out there that he captured in part, but was often conscious. It was happening at many different places. This new kind of humor, or new to the, to the world, it seemed, of this kind of sharp, amazing, cynical humor of those kind of queens, who were really fighting for sexual freedom, merely. All they wanted was for the New York indifference about things to hit the police. And that's that would have been fine, but the police wouldn't even give that much, which is exasperating. After the first night of the rioting, the demographics of the crowd on later nights changed. The politicals came on the second and third night and fourth. But, but for the first night, it was just the local street kids. And... Um, and they had learned from the experiences of watching television and seeing how the police were abusing people in the civil rights marches and demonstrations and the peace demonstrations, etc. So they had, they had that awareness at that level. But they didn't have that experience except for a couple who had been in those movements. And uh, fortunately, I was one of those people in those movements. But most of the kids that were on the streets at Stonewall were not even really drag queens. It was like a little bit of makeup, you know, a couple of earrings. It was, it was um, some like kind of punk kind of, of, of in between. It was a gender bending more. You know, it was uh, wasn't. Uh, it certainly wasn't. None of these people were like wearing bridal gowns. I mean, all these kids who took part in the Stonewall Rebellion could not afford a bridal gown. Okay, they didn't have enough money for that kind of stuff whether they're playing drag queens or female impersonators, none of these kids were into that. They couldn't afford that. They didn't have regular jobs to pay for that kind of, of dresses. So it was just um, usually uh, some slight makeup, rouge, uh, earrings. Those are the kids who were into drag it was almost as far as it went. You know, if you put on a dress, it was, it was a uh, you know, secondhand thrift shop <laughs> dress, you know, because that's all they could afford. There was no, they weren't making big money as sex workers. You know, there was, 
I mean, um, you know, they weren't getting uh, what women sex workers were getting, you know, because they were considered less of value as people. So they got paid less for it, you know. If they made $5 for a trick, that was big money, you know. So these kids were all street kids. They were, there was no, you know, living on a fancy apartment. It was not, it was not Jager Hoover playing Mary, you know. <laughs> There's none of that, you know. They, 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 they didn't have a place to sleep <laughs> with a roof over their head, not alone, you know, a place to keep the dresses and the wardrobe. There was no, you know, but almost all these kids were living on the street, you know. And uh, if they if they found a hotel for a night, you know they were lucky. You know, those they pick up a John, he'd have sex with them in a hotel, which was not the usual case. Usually, these Johns would go down to the piers and the parks and and have a quickie, and that was it. And uh, with sex, but when they were lucky, these kids they could get a hotel room where they could sleep all night in a bed, even if they were dirty old hotels. And they would bring their friends in if they got the if they got the room. They'd invite their friends in to sleep too in the in the room instead of on the sidewalks, instead of in the instead of in the alleyways, instead of in in the little uh, under the steps and on top of the steps and places like most homeless people do today. On the Wednesday night, large numbers of people turn out once for the really homophobic article, which was written by the Village Voice journalists who were present on Friday night, which was published earlier that day. In it, there was liberal use of the F word as well as snide comments about limp wrists and the like as well as LGBTQ people, large numbers of others from the political left, the counterculture movement and the black power movement came to show solidarity. Martha, who at the time was active in the Daughters of Belitis lesbian civil rights group, read about the riots in the New York Times and realised what she had witnessed on Saturday night and thought that there was an opportunity to build on what had happened. And I called, uh, her name was Jean Powers, uh, I called her, she was the one running Daughters of Belitis, and I said, we have to have a protest march. And she said, uh, well, if Mattachine Society, the gay men's organization, will co-sponsor it, then you know we can do that. So I called the head of Mattachine Society, a guy named Dick Leitch, and proposed the march. He didn't seem terribly enthusiastic, but he said, come to a meeting that we're having at town hall and we can and propose it and we'll see what the membership thinks i went to the meeting there was 400 gay guys and me and everybody was talking about the riots of course uh, they had rented town hall to talk about it and it held it held the capacity of 400 and it was packed and so i proposed the protest march and dick who was at the head of the you know, on the stage at the podium said, well, how many people want to support this? And every hand went up. And then he said, those people who want to organize it meet in that corner uh, after we're finished talking. I went to that corner, and there were a few guys there, and we talked and agreed to meet at the Madison Society office uh, to organize a protest march. And... Then the next thing that happened was we met at um, a place called Alternate U, uh, Alternate University and Alternate YOU, where they taught things like Marxism and um, karate and had various kinds of courses and groups that met that were basically radical socialists and such. Other people who'd been involved in the rebellion were also keen to capitalise on momentum, including John, who was involved in Students for a Democratic Society, SDS, probably the most prominent new left organisation in the country at that time. And we put out a, a notice in RAT newspaper, which was an SDS high school paper, that organised a meeting at Alternate U. And we gave out flyers for that meeting. Literature was given out, and we put an ad in RAT newspaper, because it's in the RAT, you can see it. And so... I was decided to be the, the chair, and the reason was because we had an agenda that we wanted to not just have a gripe session where people come together and complain and nothing comes out of it. We wanted to have and form an organization that's ongoing because we feared and worried that people would just come and complain and nothing would happen. And uh, there was about 30 people at the first meeting, and then there's the same number at the next meeting. The first meeting, there was... Um, there was a couple of women at the first meeting, and then a couple more 
at the second, and then it, it grew. And more and more women came. And the meeting was of those of us who were gay people in gay organizations, but were very much to the left, and left people who were um, gay, but who had been encouraged or urged to keep their gayness secret within the left organizations because they didn't want the left organizations didn't want to be smeared as a bunch of com, uh, of communists and queers. And, of course, the gay organizations wanted to be seen as uh, middle-of-the-road Americans and not a bunch of commies. <laughs> and those of us who were commies and queer met together and formed the Gay Liberation Front. And we had our march. We had our protest march. It was just a month after the Stonewall riot, and we marched around Greenwich Village and ended up uh, in Sheridan Square Park, just across from the Stonewall Inn. And Marty Robinson, who was part of Mattachine Society, jumped up on the water fountain as we had planned and made a speech. Uh, and then I made a speech. It was like one for the guys, one for the girls. And at the end of it, I looked around and I saw, I guess, a couple hundred, I'm not sure how many people, uh, looking and expecting something. And I thought, well, we're not going to start a riot now. So I said, okay, I think that's it for today. We're going to go home in peace now. But this is just the beginning. This is not the end. And that was how it was. It was the beginning of the Gay Liberation Front and our whole radical movement. The GLF was to be a completely new type of organization for the LGBT movement. We changed that movement, the Gay Liberation Front. I was one of the, I chaired the first meeting. We were open to all ages. We didn't care what you dressed as, and we wanted people to come out of the closet. So it was um, Stonewall in the 60s was what we came out of. But So it was a different attitude for me when I'm fighting the cops who have been messing us over and using my experience. The Gay Liberation Front was organized as a basically progressive left group of gay people. It was, it was multi-issue. We, we adapted the name to be in solidarity with the National Liberation Front of Vietnam fighting U.S. imperialism. That was a conscious decision on our part to, to do that. And, um, and so basically, we had progressive politics and something very, very important that we promoted and it became the, the name of our newspaper, Come Out. In a sea change from previously, the GLF wanted gay people to come out and finally live their authentic lives out in the open. Till Stonewall, the homophile movement was advocating privacy and to be left alone. That's all they wanted. They wanted to have the, the government stop harassing them and to allow them to be themselves in, in privacy. We argued that people needed to come out of the closet until people knew us, we could not change people, and that to learn how many of those there were. So our our view of saying coming out of the closet was totally totally opposite of the homophile movement, which was privacy and secrecy. So GLF created a support system. We we supported each other, and we said we were a community, and we identified ourselves, and we did something else. We identified who we were. We said we were gay. We took the word gay because that's what we called ourselves, and we made that name known to the mountains of Nepal, to the oceans around this world, and everybody knows what the word gay means now. That was an important historic point that we created an identity because until then, uh, there was a small number of people who said they were homophiles, but you know there was nobody knew what the hell that was. <laughs> And, and so um, homosexual, more people knew that, but, but a lot of people didn't even know what that was, you know? So, um, but we got it out the word. We got it from out of the closet. We got it out clearly in people's identities and awarenesses that we were around. The difference when we became the Gay Liberation Front was that we weren't trying to assimilate. We weren't trying to become part of an America at that point that I saw, uh, you know, from the point of view of what was going on in Vietnam and civil rights and all of those things, um, 
we wanted to change America, not to become part of the way it was. We wanted to overturn the system. And so GLF, we had a platform of sorts. We made contacts and alliances with the Black Panthers, um, also with a Puerto Rican liberation group called the Young Lords that were uh, in uh, Spanish Harlem in New York City. Uh, we made uh, alliances with the feminist movement and with uh, various socialist organizations. The idea was that we weren't just focusing on civil rights for gay people, we were focusing on an entire social change in the United States. In addition to organizing protest activities, the GLF started to try to build a radical, gay, self-organized counterculture. We approached the bars demanding that they put up bulletin boards and that we could post literature in them. That changed also the gay community because until then, not only the mob bars, but even the non-mob bars, none of them had space for you know putting up on bulletin boards and allowing flyers to be kept, etc. We saw these bars as the places that we wanted to um, organize. And of course, there was a lot of resistance to that by the bars, you know, as well as the customers. But what we did is we got a community, and we started organizing around that we should have gay centers, that we should be taking care of each other, that we need to uh, build that community, build organization. And within a year, the whole previous homophile movement not only was no longer around, but there were now you know a thousand gay groups around the world. You know, so from a handful of a dozen, it became a thousand, and it's grown since then, of course. And um, and I remember uh, I went to uh, the last conference of the North American Conference of Homophile Organizations. Uh, I went to uh, and I was elected as the last uh, president of it. And my goal as being elected was for one thing: to never meet again. <laughs> so it was that's what I ran on. That's what they elected me for, and no more meetings of, of the Eastern Regional Conference of the Homophile Organization were held or any groups like that. And that, that was what we did. We put an end to the homophile movement, consciously, deliberately. We didn't want the assimilationist, accommodation, uh, acceptance level. That's what GLF did. It, it got into urging people to come out of the closet, which is unheard of. Nobody had ever advocated that before. Never. Never throughout the entire history of the gay community and the gay movements and the organizations, and it goes back before Hirschfeld, that nobody was ever advocating that people should come out. So the gay liberation movement ideas spread. Publications were coming out more. Uh, people's attitudes were changing because we got in people's faces. We wouldn't accept it, you know, what they were doing. And, um, and we changed a lot of things, as you may recognize over the years. We're still at it. We did not have a name for when we first started. There was a group of us. And apparently we came from different places. There was other people who were with Mattachine, but I was with a group that was on the streets with the kids. And a couple of those were political, like Bill Katzenberg and myself who were at SDS. What we did was form different committees that did different things. Um, I was part of the group that um, did the newspaper come out so I typeset it in the typesetting office that I worked at. I went in there at night and typeset it. I wrote articles for it. Other people did the layout and um, did the artwork. And that was, you know, that was what I did. And I sold it on the streets. Uh, other people ran dances um, for gay dances at Alternate U. And we, and that was kind of an alternate to the mafia too. We didn't, you didn't have to go to the uh, gay bars. You could come to these dances, and instead of buying uh, watered down drinks, you could buy a beer or a soda or nothing if you didn't want to buy a drink, and dance with people. And you didn't have to pay extra to get in. Uh, of course, one night some of the mafia people showed up, and some of, and we had to face them down. Uh, they were trying to be threatening, but actually they ended up going away. <laughs> so we, they, they were unhappy because we were taking away business from them. 
Uh, we also went on demonstrations of one kind or another. We went on peace, uh, peace demonstrations. And there was a big peace march that was covered by the New York Post, which was a left-wing paper at the time, and now it's an extreme right-wing paper. But Pete Hamill, who was one of their columnists, referred to us as the slim-waisted creeps of the Gay Liberation Front. Uh, <laughs> he was a, quote, liberal, but um, when it came to sexual politics, he was still a uh, troglodyte. Some other liberals who didn't approve of the GLF was the American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU. I went to the ACLU in New York asking them to please provide legal observers, and they said they wouldn't because it was a criminal issue, not a civil liberties issue. And when I went to the National Lawyers Guild, which is a left-wing legal group, Carlos Lamont, who headed it, a big homophobe said, absolutely not, we, don't, we won't defend perverts. And so the reason that's important is because it, when we did the Gay Liberation Front, if you were a lawyer, you would be disbarred if you were known to be gay and lesbian because the American Bar Association had it as a, a rule that you could not be gay and lesbian and practice law. On the other side of the law, Due to the stranglehold organized crime had on gay bars, militant gay activism inevitably led to conflict with the Mafia. One example of this was following an incident in a mob-run lesbian bar. There were a couple of women dancing and a couple of straight guys, businessmen, I guess, came in for a drink. And they were not happy with the women, these two women dancing together. So they demanded to cut in and dance with the women and the women didn't want to and one of them punched one of the women and knocked her to the ground and then the guys went out. We were really upset because, you know, here were these women who, in this bar, who were paying extra to be in a mafia bar and the mafia guys weren't even protecting them. So, a bunch of Gay Liberation Front people, uh, me included, uh, men and women, went to the bar one evening and we, uh, Put on the jukebox. We danced around. We did not buy drinks. Uh, we danced in circles rather than as couples. And then I was selected by the group to be the spokesperson. So I went up to these two big guys. Now I'm a short person. <laughs> um, I think I was about five four at the time, and I've shrunk a bit since in my old age. And um, I went up to them and told them why we were doing what we were doing. And they were not happy because, we, A, you know, we weren't buying drinks or anything. And they were, I guess, scared that we were going to break up the place. And they scowled at me and said, do you know who we are? And I said, I don't know who you are and I don't care. We are the Gay Liberation Front. And then I walked away. Um, I, of course, I was scared. <laughs> I was scared they were going to you know, do some Al Capone thing and take out machine guns and shoot us. I had no idea what they were going to do, and they didn't know what we were going to do. So that, I think that was successful because we never heard about women having trouble in that bar again. Now, the term intersectionality, which many people use today to describe the connections between different types of exploitation and oppression, didn't exist back then. But the GLF fully embraced um, an intersectional approach, making links with other social movements. We demonstrated for the Black Panthers when they were in jail. We demonstrated uh, for Angela Davis when she was in the Women's House of Detention. And then, you know, when any gay person was harassed, uh, there was this guy, Diego Vinales, who was arrested during some police raid and uh, was terrified because he was here illegally and jumped out of a police department window and ended up impaled on uh, a fence and in the hospital. I don't know what happened to him afterwards, but we had a huge demonstration about that. And GLF members didn't just join these other movements uncritically, they fought to change them, like for example the mainstream feminist and black power movements. There was this women's organization called National Organization for Women, which started um, before, well before Gay Liberation Front, Betty Friedan started it, and uh, continues to this day, it's still an organization, and they were very uptight about lesbians. Uh, Betty Friedan certainly was. Her action, her attitude was, well, she called us the lavender menace. Uh, 
that uh, we would essentially tar the feminist movement by everybody saying, oh, they're all lesbians, they hate men, that's why they're feminists. So uh, women didn't feel real, lesbians didn't feel welcome in the National Organization for Women, although some of us were there. Um, they were having a conference at a public school in New York City. They'd rented it on a weekend. And uh, it was called the Second Congress to Unite Women. A group of us went in there, uh, had scouted the thing around, and we had printed up T-shirts that said Lavender Menace and made some signs. And we put the T-shirts on and then other shirts on top of it, went into the meeting, and um, at one point, one of the women went behind uh, the auditorium where the light switches were and doused the lights and threw the room into darkness. And when that happened, those of us who were part of the Lavender Menace Action, who were uh, members of the Radical Lesbians, an offshoot of Gay Liberation Front, took off the outer shirt, and there we were with our Lavender Menace T-shirts, and some people posted signs on the walls with uh, you know, funny signs, things like take a lesbian to lunch, Lavender Jane loves you, etc. And uh, as soon as we were, as the lights were on, and there we were in our Lavender Menace t-shirts, I jumped up on the stage where there were a group of women who were the panel discussion group. Um, and they were, you know, a black woman and a union woman and one representing this organization and one representing that. And I said, here we are. We had not been asked to be part of the discussion. And uh, the question is, do you want to go on with the panel as is, or do you want to hear from us? And I uh, put that question to the entire audience, and they all voted that they wanted to hear from us. So we spoke about what it was like being lesbians and, um, and, and feminists. And that changed the National Organization for Women, which then took up the cause of lesbian rights, too. And the same thing happened. There was a Black Panther convention, and I don't remember the name of it because I wasn't there, but I did hear about it afterwards, where gay people went to the Black Panther convention and convinced the Panthers to change their position on homosexuality. Out of GLF, numerous other groups emerged. Some of them came about by splits from people who supported LGBTQ rights, but not necessarily the revolutionary objectives of the group, but they still maintained the spirit of direct action and militancy of GLF. There was one group that split off from Gay uh, Liberation Front called Gay Activists Alliance, and they were, again, a civil rights organization for gay people. But what they did was, instead of quietly petitioning, they would go to city council meetings and demonstrate. So the tactics had changed for them, but the long-term goal was still the same, uh, change the politics for just for gay people. They weren't interested in changing it for everybody. The atmosphere and attitude of the GLF was totally different to the pre-Stonewall homophile movement, and the GLF basically revolutionized the whole movement. There was a conference, I think it was again in Philadelphia, the Eastern Regional Conference of Homophile Organizations, which is what they, the assimilationist gay groups called themselves. Um, and there was the Daughters of Belitis, and there was the Mattachine Society representatives. There were um, representatives of little groups that consisted of maybe um, a two people, uh, a gay couple, and their mimeograph machine. Uh, and they all met to talk about, you know, whatever it was. Gay Liberation Front sent people, too, including me. And I was both member of Mattachine, uh, not Mattachine, of Daughters of Belitis and the Gay Liberation Front. And two of my friends, uh, one of whom had been my lover, uh, were representing Daughters of Belitis. Gay Liberation Front put forth a platform and asked the uh, conference to endorse it. And it was, you know, the right to um, were consenting adults to have sex, of, you know, with whoever of their own choosing, the right to ingest the drugs of your choice. Uh, this was, you know, in the how marijuana was bad kind of a, a society at that point where it was all illegal. Um, 
there was um, the right to control your own body, which was the basic thing, the right not to be drafted and sent overseas to get your ass shot uh, or kill somebody else. Um, and then uh, the right to uh, abortion and control of your sexuality if you're a female. One of the little gay organization guys, uh, I guess it was him and his partner, uh, he was a Catholic. He was for gay rights, but he was not in favor of women's rights in terms of uh, abortion. He got up and made a speech, an anti-abortion speech, and said he couldn't possibly support that, blah, blah, blah. The two women from Daughters of Belitis jumped up in fury. Now, they were older women, and one of them had been raped and had an abortion when she was younger. That was the one who had been my lover. And they raised hell. (laughs) And as a result, the conference voted to endorse the entire Gay Liberation Front platform. So, uh, because the guys particularly didn't want to alienate all the women, and all of us, uh, either, you know, some had had abortions and or were lovers with people who had had abortions or knew people who had abortions, and um, the pressure was on. Uh, you know, you're either for women's rights or you're not. So that was, uh, I thought, an important stage in um, connecting the gay movement with feminism. They were. They never said they were gay. And all that was in there was like a you know, hundred guys packed in together, you know, not a woman in the place. <laughs> and that's what it was. And that reflects today's politics of people looking to assimilate, accommodate, you know, gay pride at the Pentagon. Uh, you know, let's all be in the FBI and the CIA. Let's out military, you know. We're, we're, we're more pro-patriotic than anybody, you know. We're more pro-war. We're more, you know, whatever because they're all trying to be accepted by the very worst, because the history of gay people is that many of our people desperately looking for acceptance go to the very worst enemies to get identity and support from. Our our view was we saw the society as bad, full of wrongs, you know, totally hypocritical, and lacking any kind of value. We didn't want that society. We rejected that society, and we wanted to end that society. Okay. Now, what happened is, as people joined the Gay Liberation Front meetings, a lot of them didn't understand where we were at, and they just came there looking for friendship and friends and stuff. And you know, and they and they watered down the politics where, you know, all they wanted was a safe space. You know, living room feminists, as I call them, where basically they wanted shelter and they. They were scared to hell of people like me who still wanted to go out and have demonstrations and protests and, you know, to take on the establishment because, you know, they want instead just the, the parties, you know, the, just the dances. Now, I was on the dance committee for GLF because I was on the board of alternate, that's where we raised our money. But I saw it as a money maker to pay for our political activities, not as a place for hiding. <laughs> So a division occurred in the GLF between the people who wanted to maintain a political focus and those who were looking for a family. The Stonewall Rebellion led directly to the creation of the GLF, but the most crucial thing which led to its place in history being recognized was the decision by a number of LGBT people in New York City to hold a commemorative demonstration on its anniversary the following year. So so Craig Rodwell is the one who came up with the idea to have a anniversary celebration for the Stonewall Rebellion. Now, Craig was not a left winger at all. Okay, he was the owner of the Oscar Wilde Bookshop, but he was a militant. Okay, and in fact, had organized demonstrations for years before Stonewall, and was looked down on by a lot of the homophiles because he was so quote militant and wanting gay power and all. Um, so he suggested that we have a a march to commemorate the rebellion, uh, which, of course, you know, horrified Mattachine <laughs> and the files who, you know, for respectability, didn't want anything to do <laughs> with Stonewall. They thought that was a terrible thing that happened. You know, it, was, it set them back years, you know, of their work with the police department. So, so we, we, we didn't have any permits, of course. The 
police refused to let us marching. We assembled on Christopher Street in front of Stonewall, and the plan was to march up 6th Avenue to go and into Central Park. Most of us didn't think we'd get there. The police refused to allow us to march. People don't know this. They put up wooden police barricades across uh, Christopher Street that goes into 6th Avenue. They blocked it off. So what we did is we marched the other way. We went up 7th Avenue and then down 10th Street and got back on 6th Avenue and went, and went north. We physically fought and pushed against the police at 14th Street and 23rd Street and 34th Street to keep marching because the cops didn't want us to march. We had no permits. They weren't going to give a bunch of faggots permits to be marching over a, a rebellion against the police. Martin went to the march with his Puerto Rican friend, Bertie Rivera. The clinching thing was not the riot to me. It was the first march, and that clinched pride. Uh, they said there was going to be a march, and I went with Bertie, and there weren't very many of us. I was very disappointed we didn't get Fifth Avenue. We got a small section of Sixth Avenue, <clears throat> and we were supposed to march to the park. And I had imagined there were going to be lots of people, and there weren't. So we were starting to call it already the first run. And we started off in... Well, we're talking one year later. There was going to be a march, and, you know, word of mouth. I mean, the people that formed it now were very well known. But we didn't know them then. They just the word of mouth occurred. <laughs> and we did assemble for it. We did start the march. It was extremely lonely at first. We were told to go single file to stretch us out a little more. And... Uh, it, I was very nervous. I mean, I, it, it was problematical because the city was very violent at the time. As, you know, not too long after this or that same year, Kent State, uh, there was a riot of the hard hats against the um, hippies and peace, um, peace lovers. And so the, we didn't know what to expect. So it was a very, very brave thing to do. But it was an amazing thing because as we kept going, it became thicker. Now, all of a sudden, there were people on each side of me, and you could see. It was an amazing thing. As you looked up at windows, just occasionally, you would see someone giving really their full support, sometimes a maid, sometimes a worker, sometimes that lived in the area with their fist raised. You could see individuals shouting out. They felt like we were right. It wasn't the majority, but it was enough to make my heart smile. I remember this one very good-looking guy, amazing cooking, blonde and gorgeous and looked like he was fighting with himself. He was watching us. He looked weird. What he was fighting was his desire to join us, and he broke through. Uh, he jumped the line and came in with us and grabbed somebody's arm, and they were marching. It was amazing. And then the crowd kept growing and growing. By the time we were on into the 50s, it was quite a crowd. And then around 57th Street, the police told us to stop. We couldn't move anymore. And I just couldn't believe it. I said, after all this, you're going to stop us from going into the park? He said, I'm not stopping you from going into the park. There's too many of you. You have to go in and wait. Some of you have to wait. I couldn't believe what he was telling me. And sure enough, when I went in, the park was covered with a multitude of gay people. It was the most beautiful thing. And on top of uh, this hill was this Latin or Latin drag queen or transvestite doing this amazing dance that really did represent freedom. First time I really understood modern dance. And she expressed the whole thing as we all watched, looked up and watched her. It was an amazing event because what started off as a question mark in the village ended up as exclamation point, as I always say, in the park. So that was, after that, there was pride. I remember marching and I remember being in Central Park. And I remember these hordes and hordes of people um, all dressed differently and there was one guy who was dressed in a white sheet, not like a Ku Klux Klansman, but sort of like a bed, a bed sheet wrapped around. His head was bare. And he had an enema bag uh, uh, taped to his sheet and a sign that saying Penn, uh, as in Pennsylvania, enema club. So this was his sexuality. He liked to get enemas. Um, and we sort of looked at him like he was weird, but then... Uh, one of my friends uh, kind of shrugged her shoulders and said, well, it's all inclusive. <laughs> We're all here, however weird we are. <laughs> and I guess that was kind of the feeling, like 
whoever you are, however weird, however different, you're welcome here, and you'll be treated with respect. We were, we amazed ourselves because there was, you know, we thought there'd be, a, maybe if we were lucky, a couple of hundred, and there was a couple of thousand with us, and a lot of people walking on the sidewalk along in support who didn't have the guts to get out on the street. And when we got up to um, Central Park, we went up to the Sheets Meadow, the Great Mall, and and we hung, we had a little gate in there. Nobody had speakers. We didn't have any rally. None of us thought we were going to get there. So there was no speakers at the end. It was just uh, people coming together, and we were delighted that there were several thousand of us, several thousand, you know, way beyond anything we had expected. I mean, it was an instantaneous success, and uh, it showed what you could do. In fact, Mattachine organized a counter picnic in New Jersey to discourage people. This is New York Mattachine. Now, Washington, D.C. Mattachine was Frank Kameny. He joined our march. So Barbara Giddings joined our march. People who were homophile, but, but they recognize how much better it is <laughs> with our approach than, the, than that approach. <laughs> and so, um, but the, if you can imagine organizing a counter picnic in New Jersey so that your members would have, you know, keep them away from those militants and troublemakers. Because we would not accept anything less than full respect and rights. We pushed against the cops to get up the street. Annual commemorations continued and spread to more and more cities around the world. And through the 80s and 90s, the term gay pride and pride became more commonly used than the original language, which was normally about things like gay freedom or gay liberation. Now, many places observe Pride Month in June, a month-long celebration of LGBTQ people, history and culture usually culminating in a pride parade or demonstration around the anniversary of the first night of the Stonewall Riots. Pride in London in 1984 and 1985 came to be really important, both in the Great Miners Strike that year and in the gay liberation movement in the UK. Our next three episodes are going to be about that. And in 2018, Pride finally spread to every continent, with LGBT workers on Antarctica organising an event. John thinks that there's an important lesson to be learned from all his experiences at this time. There needs to be an independent LGBT movement um, because of, of corporate interests who, of course, oppose independent movements and they want to, whatever way, destroy them or disable them or make them ineffective. So it's very important for those forces that they subvert and take over and eventually destroy independent movements. So having an independent, grassroots, democratic-based movement of self-empowerment is very important for the future for gay and lesbian people, for all people, in fact. When we met up with Martin at the Stonewall to talk some more, I asked if he was still in touch with any of his old friends from those days. Man. Half those queens died by 1975 from drugs, and the other half died mostly from AIDS. There are very few left. That's why I started speaking. I never spoke about Stonewall until 10 years ago, because then I realized it was my duty, because there's so few left. Yes, it was very tragic. They had tragic lives. They there was no happy ending to their life. Yeah, exactly. Not at all. And yet, look what they did. It's global now. Yeah, it's amazing. You should see these queens. They would bring a tear to your eye. How mistreated, how miserable their lives were. How poor. How off the cuff and living day to day and meal to meal. And trying to find a place to sleep that night. Or sleeping with someone just so you could be warm. It was just not a good life. Tragically, many activists from those days are no longer with us. Marsha P. Johnson herself was found dead in the Hudson River shortly after Pride in 1992. While she had a massive head wound, police ruled her death a suicide, despite everyone who knew her telling police she was not suicidal. It took until 2012 for activists to pressure police into reopening the case as a possible homicide. But today, her death still remains a mystery. Looking back now, 50 years on, Martin reflects on what that period meant for him. And we had changed. Everything had changed to gay people already by 1969. I mean, if you look at the gay press, it had completely changed by 1969. Gay pulp fiction had changed by 1969. We had all changed. We just didn't know. Well, the time to think about it is really about now. I mean, we didn't think much of it at first. It was just a beginning. 
and uh, we didn't dwell on it. And there were so many issues to deal with in the 70s that uh, Stonewall wasn't, uh, I don't think, appreciated in the way it is now. I mean, now I can see myself how amazing this thing was. Then it was, to me, was just a riot that put us on the map. We were different. Gay people were different. That's what was different. And everything that came around, even the winning of hearts of minds, only could have been done because gay people were different. We were all different the next day. We didn't even know it. And uh, that's what changed everything. I mean, I start, I went back, you know, to school the next week, it was September, and every paper I did was gay. I mean, <clears throat> some of them were challenged by the professors, but I insisted. And um, I, that's what I did. And I'm sure everybody else did their, their way, their thing. But we all pushed forward in the smallest ways. But it meant much for the larger picture. I mean, the 70s became interesting. I mean, all of a sudden there were gay patrols to stop gay bashing, which was amazing. And lots of posters and signs announcing lots of things. Uh, gay news, not just word of mouth anymore, which was often very accurate, but now it was in print. There was something was going on. Every month added something. It was too much to take in, too much to analyze. Uh, so I think all these years that have passed, it's easier and better to analyze it because it's the only time we could do it. Because the worst thing back then was not only to be oppressed, but to be ignored. And that can't happen now. For Martha, that time marked a shift from timidity to pride, both in the LGBTQ community and in herself. The difference, I think, was that um, we did develop pride. And instead of feeling cowed and feeling like... Um, we were less than, um, because, you know, with that kind of message happening all throughout society, you can't help but um, internalize it. And it was the beginning of shaking that off, of beginning to feel like we're okay, we're uh, just as good as anyone else, and we have the right to be who we are. And that made a huge difference. That did mean pride. It did mean uh, a certain confidence in what we did and for me I know I I went through that too Uh, I stopped trying in some ways to assimilate Um, I I had been trying to um, relate to guys sexually and it never really worked I I mean it worked in the sense that I, I was able to enjoy the sex but I never fell in love with a guy and that's a huge difference uh with a woman, I would fall in love and feel pas- feel emotional passion, not just uh, sexual pleasure. And at, after Stonewall, it was like, I'm not even going to bother to try. I don't care anymore. I don't care what um, the straight world thinks. And um, it kind of freed me to be uh, angry and use the anger to try to change the world in ways that I hadn't before. For John, confronting the police was something he'd done before, but at Stonewall, everything was different. I was in heaven, <laughs> fighting the cops and having other gay people out there too doing it. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a new experience for me dealing with the cops. What was a new experience was seeing other gay people joining in doing the same thing. That I'd never seen, I'd never experienced that camaraderie, I'd never seen gay people standing up instead of being victims. The hurt look ended that night. The, the uh, acceptance of being repressed, of, um, of being uh, abused, that ended the first night of Stonewall. That's why Stonewall is important. Because it's not only because we formed the Gay Liberation Front, which is absolutely essential. Stonewall would have been nothing in history if we didn't do two things. One form the Gay Liberation Front, and two, hold a march on the anniversary of it to celebrate, it, which became the Pride Marches, which became world, worldwide. We have won, at least temporarily, because with the current administration and the backlash, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. You never do. Um, we've won gay marriage in this country and a lot of other countries. Uh, we've won the right to... Uh, join the military openly and go kill other people uh, at the behest of the corporations. Uh, I am not thrilled about that. And um, 
we have one uh, certain protections depending on what part of the country you live in. We don't have uh, national equal rights yet. But what we didn't get and what I still feel is the now the biggest, most important thing, we did not overturn the empire. We did not overturn the capitalist system, and it's gotten a lot worse, as you know, uh, the economic inequality. Um, we are living in an empire that continues to kill people around the world en masse, um, I have been writing articles on my blog posts about just what the empire has done uh, in I Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, and now what we're doing in Venezuela. Uh, we didn't change that. And to me right now, that's the most important thing. While huge improvements in LGBT rights have been won in recent decades, there's still a long way to go until everyone is free to have the absolute most basic human right there is, of just being able to be who they are. And of course, any type of discrimination is also a class issue, because if you're not rich, you're always going to be more at risk, for example from dismissal or mistreatment by your employer. In the US, there is still no federal prohibition of discrimination against LGBT plus people, although as we finish this episode, the US Supreme Court is currently considering this. But, you know, given its conservative bias, it's probably unlikely to do so. Trans people, especially trans women of colour, continue to be at risk of extreme violence and murder, and murders of LGBT people continue to get acquitted or get reduced punishments because of, quote, gay or trans panic defences. Around the world, only about 25 countries recognise same-sex marriage, while homosexuality is illegal in 72 countries and subject to the death penalty in 14. And things aren't getting better everywhere. Brunei only just introduced the death penalty by stoning for homosexuality, and the British territory of Bermuda became the first place to repeal gay marriage in a measure recently signed into law by the British governor John Rankin. Meanwhile, a backlash against trans rights is growing, aided by the mainstream media, a re-emboldened extreme right, and shamefully, many of those who consider themselves feminists, socialists, and, in the UK at least, even some anarchists. But Martha takes hope in what happened at Stonewall. It is possible, it did happen, that a small group of ordinary working class people can change the world. If you're determined and you're willing to take the risks, we did, and it's possible to do that now, and we just have to keep doing it. And I'm hoping that young people will continue to do it. And I am inspired by some of them, like Greta Thunberg in Sweden, um, the environmentalist, or Asma Mahfouz in Egypt, who started that Arab Spring. Uh, unfortunately, she, I believe, is currently under house arrest, and the Arab Spring got squashed. But they made a difference, and uh, it doesn't mean if you try that you're guaranteed victory. But sometimes you are, sometimes you win, and you have to take that chance. And of course, if you don't fight, you are always guaranteed to lose. Stand up, stand up, stand up. That thought brings us to the end of our episodes on Stonewall, the GLF and Pride. Uh, we hope you enjoyed them at least half as much as we enjoyed speaking with John, Martha and Martin. Uh, they told us a load of really fascinating stuff which we couldn't fit into these main episodes, so we've put some of it into a bonus episode for our Patreon supporters. You too can support us on Patreon for as little as $2 a month and get benefits like exclusive early access to episodes, bonus audio, free and discounted merch and more. We are spending loads more time on our podcast through 2019, taking time out from our day jobs. But really, this is only going to be sustainable beyond that if we get more support from our listeners on Patreon. You can find out more and sign up at patreon.com slash history. If you can't afford to support us, that's totally fine. Instead, please just give us a review on Apple Podcasts, and share our episodes on social media, or tell your friends about us, maybe. As always, we've got more information, photos and the like of our interviewees and some of the stuff we've spoken about on our website, workingclasshistory.com, and linked to in the show notes. 
John O'Brien is still as active as ever, doing a lot of work in radical history and has amassed a massive collection of a quarter of a million items related to social movements around the world. John is always looking for more items for his collection as well as financial contributions or any offers of space to store or display them. So if you can help with any of that, drop us an email on info at workingclasshistory.com and we'll put you in touch. You can see Martha Shelley's writings and buy her books, including her forthcoming novel, A Meteor Shower, uh, the third book in a historical fiction trilogy about the ancient Middle East on her website, uh, linked in the show notes. We've produced some Stonewall 50th anniversary merch to help support our work, as well as John's and Martha's. So check that out on our website, linked to in the show notes. This narrative was recorded by Jesse French. The music for this episode is Stand Up For Your Rights by the International Gay Society, courtesy of Chapter Music. Links to stream it and buy it in the show notes. Um, it's from a great album of songs from the gay liberation movement um, in the 70s, so check that out. As always, thank you so much to all of our patrons, whose generous support enables us to keep making this podcast and running WCH. Catch you next time. Wow.